Well, good morning and uh, Merry Christmas to all of you a few days early, but um, we're continuing our studies this morning in the Gospel of John, but in, in the Lord's providence, it's a passage most appropriate for this uh, time of year, this season of the year. John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for He existed before me. For of His fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it and our time of worship this morning. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Charles Spurgeon once said, I think this was in the first sermon he preached in his, the beginning of his great London ministry, he said it as a relatively young man with great uh, insight. He said, I know nothing which can so comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the winds of trial as a devout musing upon the subject of the Godhead. In other words, there is nothing more practical or peaceful or pleasurable than knowing God and pondering Him. It's our highest thought and our greatest pursuit. But how can we know Him? After all, the Lord said, I dwell on a high and holy place. Paul said that God dwells in unapproachable light. Who can ascend so high beyond the cosmos? Who can enter into that light? No one. It is unapproachable. Left to ourselves, to to human reason or mystical imagination, man can never know God. So God made Himself known to us. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's how the the final portion of John's prologue, his preface, his introduction to the gospel of John, this fourth gospel, begins. The Word became flesh. This is the the first time that John has used this this term, halagos, the word, since verse 1. So it recalls all that he wrote about the word, about the Lord at the beginning. He was in the beginning, John wrote, the absolute beginning. When the world and time and history began, when everything began, He was already there. He was with God. And further, He was God. He is distinct from God, and yet is God. It's a way of describing the relationship within the Godhead between God the Father and God the Son, two of the three persons of the Trinity. It is through Him, John says in verse 3, through the Word, or the Son, that all things came into being. He is the Creator of everything. What he says is, apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, there there are no exceptions to this. Everything outside of God, who is eternal, who is uncreated, everything outside of Him, outside of the triune God, was created by Him, by Christ. 
In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17, Paul tells us that he not only created everything, but he holds everything together. He keeps everything in existence by the power of his will. That's Christ. Now that gives us some appreciation of this great statement in verse 14, because here John states that the Creator became a creature. The second person of the Trinity became a man. But John put it more bluntly than that, or as, as one commentator put it, his statement is almost shocking. The Word became flesh. Not the Word was born, or even the Word had a body prepared for Him, as in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, but the Word became flesh. But it's a word carefully chosen by John to make an unambiguous statement about Christ, one that leaves no doubt that He who was with God and was God became flesh and blood. As the shorter catechism states, he took to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. He had a genuine human nature, yet without sin. And again, that truth is at the heart of Christianity, that, that God became one of us and one with us. That the Creator became a creature, that He became a man. One of the old theologians declared it a wondrous mystery. God has become human. He remained what He was, and what He was not, He became. When He became a man, He, he did not stop being God. He remained what He was from all eternity, but He did enter into a new form of existence. Not as some superman, but as the God-man. He has all of the properties and powers of God and all of the properties and powers of man. He was and will be forever fully God and fully man without mixing or confusing his two natures. Now that's a lot of theology. But that's the meaning of John's words in these first 18 verses of the fourth gospel. And it's not only the, the testimony of John the Apostle, but of John the Baptist as well. In verse 15, he said of Jesus, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, Jesus in time and history was born six months after John the Baptist. So, how did he exist before John? Some of his, John's audience might have uh, wondered about that if they had known the situation. Well, the answer is Jesus is a unique man. We all begin at conception and birth. He was born in Bethlehem, but existed before that. Pre-existed Bethlehem. He was in the beginning with God before he became incarnate. It is a wonderful mystery, but it was only by becoming flesh that God could do his great work of salvation by dying for us. And, and only in that way, by becoming a man, becoming flesh and blood, could he reveal himself, could God reveal himself to us. And so he became a real historical man. We celebrate it at Christmas, but it's something we should celebrate every day. Consider every day Christ's incarnation, which is two Latin words meaning in fleshing. Charles Wesley put it succinctly in his hymn, which we just sang, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. That's John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. It was the supreme revelation. Not the first revelation, 
There was a long history of revelation preceding the Lord's birth. The epistle to the Ephesians, or rather the Hebrews, begins stating that fact that in the past God spoke to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, but in these last days has spoken to us in His Son. God revealed Himself in a real person, with a face, with a body. God became man and dwelt among us, John said. Now that's an equally shocking statement because this one who for all eternity dwelt on a high and holy place in unapproachable light, not only entered this world, but made his home among us. And when John says among us, he at least meant among people like him. Fishermen, laborers, simple people, and lived a common life. Now that's completely unexpected. He didn't shelter himself, this Son of God, from the harsh realities of this world. He didn't dwell in obscurity or live in a palace where he could have, ha have enjoyed a soft life. He was born in a stable among animals. He, he grew up in a carpenter's shop among the tools of his trade. He humbled himself by becoming a man so that men, women, people might see him in everyday life and know him in that way. He became like us. He entered our experience. He dwelt among the, the most common of us, rubbed shoulders with us. That is where John says we saw his glory in the day-to-day -day experiences of life. And the fact that, that Jews, like John, should have come to believe that, believe that, that God became flesh is amazing in and of itself, and that's evidence of the truth of the statement that he's made. Eight of the nine writers of the New Testament were Jews. And all were taught and all believed that, that there is only one God and no human is divine. Yet they all teach that the one God exists in three persons, not three gods, but one God existing in three persons, and that Jesus is both God's Messiah and God's Son. How is that? It's because they saw His glory when He dwelt among them. Now this word dwelt is very revealing about the Lord's earthly life and glory. It, it is uh, every bit as striking as the word flesh. It means to pitch a tent or to dwell in a tent. And that, that would have had special significance to a Jewish reader because this same word is, it was used of pitching the tabernacle. So the Jew would have been immediately struck by this statement and understood it as he pitched his tabernacle among us or he tabernacled among us. Uh, undoubtedly, that's the picture John wanted us to have because the tabernacle was the place where God dwelt among His people during Israel's desert wanderings and then before the temple was built. It was where He met with them. And His presence among them was symbolized in the Shekinah glory, the, the light that filled the tabernacle. One of the very, very interesting features of the tabernacle is the way it was constructed and how its glory was concealed, hidden within it. It, made, it was made of, of beautiful materials. You can read the description in the Pentateuch of, of all that went into the uh, building of this tabernacle, all the details of it, the silver sockets and the gold-plated boards supporting richly embroidered curtains and a colorful tapestry that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Its, its furnishings were of gold. The Ark of the Covenant on which the solid gold lid, the mercy seat with its cherubim, 
the, the golden lampstand and altar of incense. All of these were symbolic of spiritual truth, like the mercy seat that was sprinkled with blood once a year on the Day of Atonement to signify that reconciliation with God, peace with God, is only through sacrifice, through the shedding of blood, anticipating Christ's sacrifice and death. All of this was revealed in these beautiful things of wealth and color and light that was covered by a plain, unimpressive tent of goat's hair. That tent is what people saw, not the glory within. And it's the same with our Lord. In Isaiah 53, we read that He had no stately form or majesty. His glory was veiled in the common tent of his flesh. And yet John said that as Jesus dwelt among them in that humble state, we saw his glory. So there, these are not things of John's imagination. It's what he saw. In fact, in... in his first epistle, 1 John, he begins that book by saying, what we, not just John, but we, the apostles and many others, what we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands, we proclaim. And here he assures us that the one of whom he writes was a real person, an historical figure, and a person of great glory. We saw his glory just as others did. That's what he says. He saw his glory. John, along with Peter and James, saw the Lord's transfiguration when uh, they were on the mountain and his face shone like the sun and his garments became as white as light. It, it was as though the, the tent of the tabernacle were open and uh, all of the Shekinah glory shone through. But John doesn't mention that incident, the transfiguration, in his gospel, and probably had something else in mind. What he and others saw while Jesus dwelt among them during his, his daily life, when, as I said, they rubbed shoulders. It was among the people and the things that he did and the way he responded and react, reacted. It, it was, was glory that set him apart from all men. Not glory like that of Alexander or Caesar, but uh, unique glory. Glory, John says, as of the only begotten from the Father. That's a Significant description, the only begotten. We're familiar with it from John 3.16. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. It's actually one word. It means something like the one and only or the unique one. And since His Father is God and, and He is God's Son, the glory is the glory of God. In Christ, all of the attributes of God are seen. And John indicates that when he describes his glory as glory full of grace and truth. Again, those, those words lead us back to the Old Testament, to Exodus chapter 33, where Moses asked God to show him his glory. And when you, you, you read that, you think, what must Moses have been thinking of? Well, I, I can imagine that he was thinking of something spectacular. I want to peek into that glory that, that no one can really see. And the Lord agreed. But he said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He dispenses mercy sovereignly, but he dispenses it liberally. Now that tells us a great deal about God's glory. Certainly it is light and power and all that we might imagine it to be. But here it is also, and here it is primarily, His goodness. And so Moses stood on Mount Sinai, hidden in the cleft of a rock, and the Lord descended in a cloud and passed in front of him. And as he did, he proclaimed 
The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, or grace and truth. That's God's glory, which is His goodness. And that's what John saw in Jesus. He saw grace, which is kindness for those who don't deserve it. It's God's unconditional love for the sinner, His unmerited favor. He saw this glory in the miracles that He performed. His signs, as John calls them. Healing the lame man, giving sight to the blind, cleansing lepers, healing them, and raising the dead. They were acts of grace and mercy, not to the deserving, but the undeserving. Luke records an incident in Luke 17 in which the Lord healed ten lepers. There's a group of them. And He healed all ten of them. Only one of them thanked Him. John saw grace in the everyday experiences of life. He saw it in the way He handled people from those lepers who never even thanked Him to others. It's in the way He dealt with people, with the the, the kindness, gentleness, love, and forgiveness of our Lord. And He heard truth in the Lord's words. His teaching was true. But he, He was not only truthful in what He said, He was gracious in the way He said it. Some people are kind, they, they are loving and affectionate, they, they have grace, but truth is a little difficult for them. Is, they shade it a bit. It's difficult to be candid with people. And then there are those who, who are honest, but stern, blunt, and not gracious. Well, Christ was both. The two were perfectly combined in Him. He never compromised the truth, And he always communicated it correctly, graciously. In chapter 8, when the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman to him whom they had caught in adultery and told him to judge her, he did so with grace and truth. He did it in a way that exposed the hypocrisy of her accusers, but without overlooking her sin. He addressed it. He called it sin, but he told her to go and do it no more. He spoke truth to her. He didn't compromise, didn't gloss over her failure, but he didn't crush her with it. He was compassionate, gracious in healing and forgiving. So in in that and, and many other examples... John saw, we see, the grace with which he invited the tax collectors and sinners to come to him and and the truth that repelled the hypocrites, the scribes and Pharisees. He didn't conceal or compromise the truth. He spoke it plainly, even when pronouncing wrath and judgment. He did that in a gracious manner with tears of compassion. His life and ministry are not truth alone or grace alone, but grace and truth. And his life was filled up with that. He is full of grace and truth, John said. Now that's something to see in a crooked age. People today talk a lot about transparency, about genuineness, sincerity, and honesty. There's nothing new in that. One of the more eccentric Greek philosophers was Diogenes, who would walk the streets of Athens in broad daylight holding up a lighted lamp, looking for an honest man. He didn't find one. Poor Diogenes, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, because that man came in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, He is the embodiment of grace and truth. He is the light of the world. And John the Apostle witnessed it in the Lord's words and works. But Christ came to do more than reveal great things. He came to impart them. 
He is the source of all our blessings. That's what John says in verse 16. For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. He is an infinite reservoir of goodness and blessing. There's no end to the supply of it. And he fills us with it. We've all received of his grace and truth. Literally, we have received grace instead of grace, or grace in place of grace. The, the idea being that there is a continuous supply of it. As one supply recedes, another replaces it. It's, it's like the waves that continually break on the shore, one after another. Some of you have probably witnessed that. I've had the pleasure of witnessing it more than once. I think I've mentioned this more than once, but... Uh, going to the coast of Maine and sitting on that rocky coast and looking out on the, uh, the great Atlantic, and there below are these waves, large waves, huge waves that come crashing in on these great rocks. And the spray comes up, and, and then they recede, and there's this foam and this turquoise blue that goes out, and then another wave comes and crashes on the rocks, and it never stops. It's constant, continual, and it has been for millennia upon millennia, constantly. That's the grace of God and how he supplies it to us. Now, that's my illustration, but I think Dr. Johnson probably had a better one, more to the point, from the care that is given to a garden. And he spoke of how a gardener does that, and he could speak that, of that with some authority because he himself was a gardener and the, uh, the son of a gardener. A gardener waters a plot of ground where he has plants, and he pours water on the ground, and he waits until it sinks into the earth, and then he pours some more until the plant is properly watered. And in that way, the Lord is constantly supplying us with grace. That's what the Lord gives to the Christian. That's what the Lord gives to the child of God, the, the believer in Jesus Christ, a constant supply of grace to the end that we are properly, constantly cared for and kept in faith. I mean by that kept believing. Your faith from beginning to end is a sovereign gift of God didn't arise from your brilliant intellect or your perceptiveness. It is a gift of God from beginning to end, and He's always supplying us with that, with the faith that we need to persevere. Now, the child of God may wander away from Him, and we are prone to do that as the the hymn writer said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Who doesn't know that to be true? The attractions of the world are great. The spirit of the age has a real hold on all of us, a pull upon us. But his grace is greater, and his grace will always lead us back to himself and lead us into the greatest blessing. I like Leon Morris's comment, grace is always an adventure. No man can say where grace will lead him. No, we don't know where grace is going to lead us in particular, but what we do know is it will always be to a good place, to the best place. However difficult it may be and how, how, however obscure that place may be in our mind as we're going through the difficulties, we know this, that His grace will lead us to the best place. Cares for His people. Only Christ can do that. Only He can supply this grace upon grace. That's the reason His birth, His incarnation was necessary. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now, the law was not a failure. John's not suggesting that. Paul doesn't suggest that in Romans or the book of Galatians. The law succeeded in its purpose to reveal God's character, to reveal His perfection, 
and show man his own failure. It was necessary for that purpose. The law came in to expose our sin and make known to us our need of a Savior. But that's all that the law could do. It's all it was intended to do, but that was all it could do. It was limited. And that's the point of the contrast that John makes here between the law of Moses and the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. Christ gives blessing unconditionally as a free gift apart from works, apart from any personal merit or accomplishment. That's grace. The law can tell us what to do. It can't enable us to do it. It, it can tell us that we are guilty and we're spiritually dead, but it's powerless to give life. Christ, through His death and resurrection, gives life. Again, that's the reason the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Perfectly. So that He could offer up Himself as a sacrifice for us in our place and in so doing, pay for all our sins by His death so that we might live. But He also went beyond the law of Moses in revealing to us the person and the character of God. John says simply in verse 18, He has explained Him. That's the conclusion of John's prologue, his introduction to this fourth gospel. Christ is the great revealer of God. But he, he begins the statement with a reminder of man's inability to know God. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Now, it's true, there were appearances of God in the Old Testament, theophanies and visions. God, as we uh, considered earlier, allowed Moses to see him pass by on Mount Sinai. But he also warned Moses, you cannot see my face. No man can see me and live. What Moses saw on Mount Sinai was what F.F. F. Bruce called the afterglow of the divine glory. But he did not see the essential being of God who dwells in unapproachable light until Christ came. And in him, whom Paul called the image of the invisible God, people saw him. He has explained him, John says. Uh, that word explained is the word from which we get the word exegesis, which means basically interpretation. So it's been said Jesus is the exegesis of God, the interpretation and explanation of God. And, and he was absolutely, uniquely qualified to be that, to explain God, because as John says, he is in the bosom of the Father. He has the closest relationship with him the closest possible relationship any being can have. He is one with Him. He is in the bosom of the Father. He knows the mind of the Father. And He revealed Him, explained Him, which means through Christ we are able to know the person and character of God. And that's the highest knowledge there is. No greater knowledge than that. No theoretical physicist has that kind of knowledge. No one, no philosopher, no mathematician, no any characterization you want to give, anyone knows him in that way. That is the highest knowledge there is. And it's what Spurgeon said comforts the soul, calms the billows of sorrow, and speaks peace to the winds of trial. But it's ours only through Christ. Apart from Him, there's no knowledge of God. He is beyond us. We are separated from Him by sin and infinity. In Isaiah 57, 15, He said, I dwell on a high and holy place. But He added the amazing words, and also 
with the contrite and lowly of spirit. In a sense, I suppose that applied to Christ. He was lowly of spirit. He humbled himself to become flesh, to become one of us. He humbled himself. He emptied himself unto death, even death on a cross to reveal the Father and to save us by dying in our place. And actually, as John will go on to explain, or as Jesus himself will state in chapter 12, that death is his glorification. He speaks of it as being glorified. So the, the revelation of God's glory is seen in its fullest extent at the cross of Christ where the justice and holiness of God met the grace and the love of God. And there, at the expense of his own life, the righteous one died for the unrighteous. There we see the great glory of God. And God was with him. His Father was with him through all of that. And when a person humbles himself or herself, becomes lowly of spirit by recognizing their guilt and their need of the Savior and trusts in Him, then God dwells with them and never leaves them. So if you've not done that, but want this greatest of knowledge, want the knowledge of God, knowledge that is personal as well as intellectual, to have a personal relationship with the God of the universe. But if you know that you are a sinner and in need of a Savior, then look to Him. You'll have that knowledge. Recognize your own sin and your own need. Believe in Him. And you will have that personal relationship. Come to the Father through the Son by trusting in Christ as your Savior the one who suffered for sinners so that all who believe in him would have forgiveness and everlasting life. May God help you to do that. And you who have, I hope it's every one of you, you who have rejoice in this relationship you have, this knowledge you have of him, he'll never leave us. And praise him for that. I'm going to close in a word of prayer now. And then we'll sing our final hymn, and that will be an introduction or transition to our taking of the Lord's Supper. So let's, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, this great text of Scripture that in the time we have is not enough time to expound it. But what, what a wonderful thing. That the Word became flesh, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, humbled Himself, emptied Himself to become one of us and dwelt among us, rubbed shoulders with us, with people, and revealed Your goodness and grace. And then, of course, that grace and truth, the glory of it was revealed most especially at the cross of Christ where He died in our place. We thank you for that. Thank you for the salvation we have in him. We thank you for the salvation which is attributed altogether to our great triune God. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's, let's stand and sing hymn, or hymn number 18 in the Songs of Praise book, In Christ Alone. Hymn number 18.